talking about chlorinated hydrocarbons in the environment of this occasion, and that's what I'll try to do. First of all, a few words about organic chemistry, which came into existence as a science between 1830 and 1860, give and take a few years. The question about organic chemistry was, how can there be so many compounds made of so few elements? The organic realm is enormous in terms of the number of compounds, and yet they are practically all made, or the great majority of them, are made from four elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Carbon is always present. Hydrogen is almost always present. Oxygen and nitrogen frequently, and a lot of other elements very occasionally. But this was, I think, the extraordinary thing about this subject called organic chemistry. Now, to come immediately to the answer <coughs> of how there can be so many compounds from carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, the answer which was worked out during the period I mentioned was based on the theory that carbon can have four connections, or valence. Valence was the scientific word. I'll use connections sometimes, at least I don't want to load this lecture with technical words. Carbon has four connections, nitrogen has three, oxygen has two, and hydrogen, hydrogen has one. If you put them together in a way that they have this kind of connection, you will be able to present the structures of organic Compounds. May I have the slide, please? There's only one slide, so I probably <laughs> won't mix it up. <laughs> Is it showing here? <laughs> Anybody see it? <laughs> <laughs> Projector probably won't show only one slide. second picture, which is a, a structural drawing of it. I haven't drawn the H's, but out at the end of those lines, you, there are H's. That's methane, a gas which was discovered in swamps in Birmingham, England about 19, 1800. And you see it uh, has one carbon and four hydrogens. Because carbon has four connections or valences and hydrogen has one. Uh, you see also that the carbons can connect to each other. The second one shows that, two carbons connected, and there are six hydrogens. And the next one, three, and the next one, four. Those 
The third and fourth propane and butane are familiar to anybody who has used bottled gas. Uh, you'll notice in under uh, number numeral two, the C2H4 has uh, ethylene shows that double connections can exist between carbons. Again, the carbon you'll see has four connections. Each one of them has four. Uh, two of them are to hydrogens. That's represented by the short lines going above and below. And the other two are to the other carbon. And then acetylene next to that shows that carbon can connect uh, with what's called a triple bond. And then over on the far right, the Singmark butadiene shows that two double bonds. These give you the variety of possibilities and begin to give you some idea of how there can be so many compounds. These are all made out of just carbon and hydrogen. <coughs> hydrogen, you'll notice. And uh, by playing around with that, you can uh, <coughs> create on paper quite a few compounds, an inf almost infinite number, in fact. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a game. Now, the, the trickiest part of the game was a compound, now I'm talking about number three, C6H6, a compound which actually existed called benzene, which as you can see looks very difficult to fit into that scheme where carbon has four connections or valences and hydrogen only one. This was successfully accomplished by a German chemist named Kekulé, I think it was 1858, in the way you see there. He says he dreamed this. Uh, there I have left off the C's as well as the H's, but in that hexagon you were to picture a C at each corner of the hexagon and at the ends of the line as usual H's. And if you ponder that a little, and I'll give you time because I'm planning to leave the slide up for a little while. Well, I guess I'm going to stand right in front of it though, aren't I? Well, anyway, uh, ponder it a short while. And uh, you will, I think, see that it fits the rules of the game. Now, uh, may I have the lights, please, even though they do demolish that. I'll have to come back to the other half of the slide in a moment. Uh, now, now, chlorine. Uh, the role of chlorine in this, uh, the role chlorine played a role in study of chlorinated hydrocarbons because it has a valence of one. It will make one connection like hydrogen, and it will easily replace hydrogen. And whereas there are a multitude of, of uh, hydrocarbons, multitude of organic compounds, there are either no chlorinated hydrocarbons in nature or virtually none. <coughs> they essentially, they don't exist. So by replacing those hydrogen atoms with chlorine atoms, the chemists made compounds which they knew something about because they had made them themselves, which they did not confuse with other things because they only knew a very few of them. They were man-made, they were understood by men. Furthermore, they found that chlorinating, replacing those H's with Cl, changes the property surprisingly little. So that the product of, of <coughs> substituting chlorines for hydrogens was recognizable as descendant from the hydrocarbon they started out with. Now, I describe this as a game. I, uh, I want to say just a word to avoid appearing to belittle the chemists. There is a side to this game that is not easy at all. When I was a student here, I was given a senior project, research project, which was exactly in this field. I was to, to brominate an organic compound. Now, brominating and chlorinating are for all practical purposes the same thing. Bromine is a little easier to handle, and so students were given that to use. So that was my project, <coughs> and I went through the term uh, you, you melt the stuff in a vessel and, and add the bromine to it and control the physical conditions and the length of time you treat it, and uh, it's fa fairly painstaking, painstaking, but the idea is that ultimately you get a brominated compound that you can identify. 
I went through the term and my bromine kept disappearing as I performed this experiment one time after another. I ended up with almost the pure stuff that I started out with except that the bromine was all gone. <laughs> now, despite that or because of it, I was allowed to leave the university shortly after that. <laughs> But I do have personal, that much personal experience, so I'm not totally ignorant of the realities of this. They are not simple, but it's simple enough to talk about it on an occasion like this. In fact, the, the real reason I'm talking about chlorinated hydrocarbons is that I think that it's necessary in the time in which we live that the public face a little of the realities of these things <coughs> and uh, I'm trying to make you face them, and I'm trying to explain them in a way that will be intelligible with regard, without regard to whether you've ever had any chemistry or not. Now this element chlorine, then, with which they replaced all these H's, uh, was discovered in 1774 by a famous Swedish chemist named Shela, who described it as a greenish gas with a suffocating odor which dissolves slightly in water corrodes metals and bleaches colored leaves and flowers. It was not thought to be an element, it was thought to be a compound. Only 35 years later, in 1810, was it decided that this stuff, chlorine, was an element because they had never been able to break it down into anything simpler. And in eight, by 1810, they had the electric battery, which had been invented 10 years earlier, and were able to subject the compounds to a new force that should break them up, didn't break up chlorine. This was done by Sir Humphrey Davy <coughs> in London at the uh, Royal Institution. Now, so having decided that it's an element, the chemists then took the next step that chemists take, they see how their new element reacts with various things, uh, with simple things like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Well, with hydrogen, uh, chlorine reacts to make hydrochloric acid, which has been known for a long time, which is probably known to most of you. Uh, in fact, chlorine had been discovered by breaking up hydrochloric acid. So there is no problem there. But with the other three, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, nothing happened when they tried to react chlorine with them, which seemed very odd because it had many, it, in many ways, it seemed very active. <laughs> this became, for a short time, a popular research. Humphrey Davy, the same man who had proved it was not an element, tried to react it. Since he couldn't react it with carbon and oxygen, he tried to react it with carbon monoxide, which is the simplest compound of carbon. Did react. He got a compound which we know as phosgene, uh, as, uh, was used as a poison in the First World War, war gas. Uh, more spectacular was the case of nitrogen. It wouldn't react with nitrogen either, <coughs> but it was found that it would react with ammonium chloride, which contains nitrogen, a long-known substance which had been called salammoniac since the Middle Ages. This discovery was made by a Frenchman named Dulong in 1811, <coughs> who probably or should have regretted it because it exploded and he lost an eye and several fingers. I have never been able to find out exactly how many fingers Dulong lost, which is embarrassing because that's the kind of things historians are supposed to be able to find <laughs> out. It's one to three according to various accounts. <coughs> Uh, Davy in London was also experimenting with what he'd made was nitrogen chloride, which is explosive. I don't recommend making it. Uh, Davy in London was also experimenting with nitrogen chloride. It also blew up in his face. He didn't suffer any more than a week off, however, from his regular work at the Royal Institution. However, this necessitated his calling in his helper a young man whom he'd hired to wash bottles some time before, named Michael Faraday. Faraday is one of the most famous scientists of the 19th century, self-taught, uh, read chemistry books. He worked for a bookbinder, and he read the chemistry books when they were brought in to be bound. And he got himself a job washing bottles at the Royal Institution, and when nitrogen chloride exploded in Davy's face, <coughs> 
Faraday replaced him for a short while, during which he undertook to do all of Davy's work, including continuing working with nitrogen chloride, which soon exploded in Faraday's face. <laughs> But these were heroic days. I mean, these things, <laughs> these things happened. These were heroic days. Faraday shortly afterward wrote somebody that chlorine was his favorite subject. <laughs> well, that took care, more or less, of the experiments to see if they could get chlorine to react with oxygen and nitrogen. On the case of uh, carbon, uh, Faraday then tried to react uh, nitrogen, or uh, uh, chlorine with C2H4, uh, ethylene, which was on the diagram when we had it, and uh, he got something. In fact, it turned out to contain only chlorine and hydrogen, what is what, which is what he was after in the first place. It's called hexachloroethane. And, uh, In, in which all of the hydrogens. Could I, can you give me the slide for just a second again? Uh, you see ethylene up there, the C with the double bond. He replaced uh, he replaced all four of the hydrogens that you see there, and he also replaced the double bond. So he got up above itself ethane. What he got was uh, ethane, uh, in the, finally, what he got was ethane with all the hydrogens replaced by chlorine. He also got <coughs> ethane with only four of the hydrogens replaced by chlorine, so there was still two hydrogen atoms in it and four chlorine. That's called tetrachloroethane for obvious reasons, and the other one is called hexachloroethane for obvious reasons. Uh, Will, uh, will you give me the light again? I'll need this slide once more, I believe, but not just yet. Uh, well, now you, you will be greatly relieved to know that I'm not going to run through the subsequent history of this. Uh, rather, I'm going to go to a quotation from about 1870 when organic chemistry existed as a science and when some of the leading chemists were design, trying to decide who deserved the credit. It was a brilliant accomplishment to have come up with this theory, which has been successful ever since. Uh, Marcel and Berthelot, one of the leading chemists of the late 19th century, said, and I quote, the rise of organic chemistry is due above all to Faraday's demonstration that chlorine replaces hydrogen volume for volume. By volume for volume, he means the same thing as I mean when I say atom for atom. The, uh, when Faraday worked, and in, in the period I'm talking about, the atomic theory had not yet been accepted, and they worked by volumes instead of the atom, which is a theoretical entity you can't see. That's not uh, uh, a matter of great importance. The, the important thing is that here we see Faraday being credit for that simple experiment I just described. Uh, for being given um, the maximum credit more than anyone else for the rise of organic chemistry. Now, two chlorinated hydrocarbons were already known. <laughs> uh, ethyl chloride, if I, well, never mind. Uh, ethyl chloride, uh, the reason I'm uh, fretting here is because I thought I was going to have that slide on all the time, but it isn't going to work, so we'll have it once in a while and I'll remark on it. Uh, two were already known. One was made about 1600 by a chemist named Basil Valentine, who was an imaginary chemist, supposedly lived in the Middle Ages. His, wo his work was pseudonymous, but he did things anyway. He reacted hydrochloric acid with alcohol. Alcohol is ethane with an OH on the end of it. And uh, he got ethyl chloride, which is ethane with one uh, hydrogen replaced by chlorine. The other one that was known by 1800 was ethylene chloride, which had been made in 1794 by four Dutchmen. Uh, 
whose names were so complicated that they were known as the Dutch chemists and never, and never mentioned by name, uh, although in Holland they were well known and uh, this may well have been resented. But anyway, they came down as the Dutch chemists through history and th the thing they had discovered was known as the Dutch liquid. Now, you will hear <coughs> Uh, the next time we get the slides, I'll point out to you what these two things are to remind you. You'll be hearing more about them than anything else through the rest of this lecture. Uh, in 1842, uh, a large nine-volume dictionary of chemistry mentioned 90 chlorinated hydrocarbons, roughly. I counted them, but because they were not precisely identified, you can't be sure. But it was a large number, about 90, were known as early as 1842. <laughs> now, the chemists were not really interested in these chlorinated hydrocarbons. They were interested in materials which exist in nature, and they don't exist in nature. But there's so many organic materials in nature that they couldn't get a handle on them. These chlorinated hydrocarbons served the chemist as a, an intermediary substance that he could actually understand because he'd made it between him and the great world of organic nature that he couldn't understand. A series of theories were put forth which went under strange names like ether and theory, type theory, substitution theory, and so forth. These were the major theories that finally led ultimately to this scheme that I put on the slide and described in the first place where carbon has four connections or valence nitrogen, three oxygen, two hydrogen, one, and that organic compounds consist of these things put together according to this rule. That's the outcome of it. All of these stages, if you look at the literature, are full of chlorinated hydrocarbons. It is quite clear that they developed the theory through the study of those materials. The crowning achievement <coughs> was the case of something known as trichloroacetic acid, which was discovered by a French chemist named Dumas in 1838. Acetic acid is, is vinegar, one of the oldest known uh, substances. And acetic acid happens to have four hydrogens in it. And he had replaced three of them, and yet it was just like vinegar. It didn't, it, it had hardly changed any from being vinegar, and yet he'd placed three-fourths of the hydrogens. Furthermore, chlorine is a very heavy element, much heavier than carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, not to mention hydrogen. So this chloro, trichloroacetic acid was somewhere, li something like 80 percent chlorine, and still it behaved like vinegar. This was too much. This was what upset the, uh, the uh, ruling powers in chemistry and uh, caused such things as the following. In the German journal in 1840, there was a letter from a French chemist or from a chemist that no one's ever heard of before or since saying that he had been working on manganese acetate. Now, a manganese acetate is vinegar reacted with the metal manganese. It contains, naturally, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and manganese. And he describes in painsta his painstaking research in which he replaced the hydrogens all with carbon, then he replaced all the oxygen with carbon, then he replaced all the, or with, with chlorine, then he replaced all the carbon with chlorine, and then he replaced the manganese with chlorine, and by now he had a compound that was all chlorine. But it's, it still acted like manganese acetate. <laughs> this letter was signed by the following name, S.C.H. Windler. <coughs> S.C.H. Windler. Schwindler. It was, uh, <laughs> it was written by Wohler, a leading German chemist, <coughs> who uh, gave it the title on the substitution law and the theory of types. And in the journal where it appeared, it appeared immediately after an article by Dumas with exactly the same title. However, they, uh, those who were using the chlorinated hydrocarbons to, to uh, 
develop a new theory of organic chemistry did triumph. Now, now I want to turn to the uses of chlorine. Uh, it was discovered in 1774, 20 years later, 94, 1794, it found its first use as bleach in bleaching. It had been found and it was discovered that it bleached colored leaves and flowers. It was used to bleach cloth from 1794, replaced all ble other bleaching agents. A very important uh, industrial use. <coughs> it was made from chlorine, or from hydrochloric acid. And actually not much was required. A very little bit of chlorine will bleach cloth. As you doubtless know, it's used to for disinfection of swimming pools now, and a very little bit of it is required for that, too. From 1825, there was an artificial soda industry in Europe, which grew to, grew to enormous size and which had as its waste material hydrochloric acid. It became the first notorious atmospheric pollutant, ultimately led to uh, serious legal uh, controls on the British chemical industry. They, as long as it, they could, they just let this, the uh, hydrochloric acid come out through chimneys, building the chimneys higher and higher. This got the hydrochloric acid out of Birmingham and carried it all the way over to Liverpool. <laughs> uh, they tried to solve the problem. They didn't try very hard until they were forced to, but they tried to solve it by converting the hydrochloric acid into chlorine, which did have a use, after all, for bleaching. But it didn't, they didn't need that much. Well, after 1900, things got even worse, because a new process for making soda came into being called the electrolytic process, in which uh, salt, sodium chloride, is divided into sodium and chlorine. And here, chlorine was the waste material itself. So there was some concern for finding new uses for chlorine. Essentially, only one was found through the whole of the 19th century, chloroform. Chloroform had been discovered in 1831. It has a formula CHCl3. It is methane, this one carbon with four hydrogens, in which three of the hydrogens have been replaced by chlorines. Uh, it was discovered in 1831. About 1850, its power of putting people and animals to sleep was noticed. This was 10 years after the beginning of anesthesia. Anesthesia was introduced in this country first, about 1840, using ether, uh, a compound, the constitution of which I'd rather not go into. You've probably heard of it. At least those of you who are anywhere near as old as I am probably been had ether administered to you. This was one of the greatest boons medicine has ever experienced, the possibility of putting people to sleep while you cut them up. Uh, ether was a boon, except that it is exceedingly inflammable, much more so than gasoline. If you have one of these little spray cans to spray on in your carburetor when it's too cold for your engine to start, the can probably contains ether. It's that inflammable. Uh, so they were glad to discover in about 1850 that they had this other material, chloroform, which also put people to sleep. But whereas there was danger of blowing of death from explosion or fire when you used ether, chloroform killed you if you inhaled too much. When I was young, chloroform was used to put away unwanted cats and dogs in the Newton dog pond, I remember. So we went down through the 19th century with people deciding which one of these things they wanted to risk. And you can gather from that that chloroform was not used very widely. Ultimately, ether came back and chloroform fell out of disuse. Now, about 18, uh, 1860, a, a an English author of a book on chemical technology named, named Muspratt, Sheridan Muspratt, he made a big thing out of this. He was concerned that chemistry is not useful, and he picked out chloroform as proof that chemistry is useful. 
And uh, he says the trouble is that the chemists don't describe all the properties of these things that they're discovering, and so the potential uses are not revealed. He was, Muspratt was a, a pioneer in chemical technology, 1860. After him, there were many textbooks of chemical technology down through the end of the 19th century and into the 20th. I've looked at most of them, and there's hardly anything in there indicating new uses for chlorine. About 1900, disinfection of, of drinking water came in. Later on, things like swimming pools. Again, something for which they didn't require very much. Paper bleaching, which used up a lot more. Paper bleaching by chlorine is the reason why books that you bought 10 years ago will fall apart in your hands, whereas books published 200 years ago are in good shape. Uh, it's very useful. In, uh, in, a book of eight, in a book on chemical technology dated 1913 by Edward Thorpe, a standard text of the early 20th century, there's mention of only two additional uses for chlorine, and they're both for making chlorinated hydrocarbons. And both uh, materials relate to chlorine, if you or to uh, chloroform. If you replace only one of these hydrogens with methane, you're supposed to be picturing that up there, uh, CH4. If you replace only one hydrogen by chlorine, you naturally get a CH3Cl, and that is called methyl chloride, and we find it being used in refrigeration by 1913, mainly because it was extremely cheap, because they found if you put chlorine in a sugar, but sugar beet residue, you get methyl chloride. If you replace two, you get uh, something with two H's and two CL's, which I will skip as not being r relevant at the moment. If you replace three, you get chloroform. If you replace all four hydrogens, you get CCl4, which is carbon tetrachloride, which was used in dry cleaning. Carbon tet is something you can buy in the drugstore, and you're probably familiar with it. This was all small potatoes. That's the point. <coughs> uh, and so we come down to the First World War with a chlorine problem, enormous quantities of chlorine that they didn't know what to do with. The First World War helped this problem because in 1915, chlorine was introduced as a war gas on the Western Front by the Germans. They were, the British were not long behind their parents, so they're just as good solvents as their parents were. Since uh, the beginning of the 19th century, the solvents have increasingly come to be carbon tetrachloride and other related materials, all chlorinated hydrocarbons. The real <coughs> boon in using up that chlorine, though, was the automobile. About 1920, tetraethyl lead was introduced to gasoline as an anti-knock agent. This was developed by Thomas Midgley of, of, of General Motors Corporation. Uh, tetraethyl lead does not contain any chlorine, but it's made from ethyl chloride. Ethyl chloride is the material I said was one of the two chlorinated hydrocarbons described before 1800. It's made from alcohol and hydrochloric acid. That material with lead are, are the raw materials for tetraethyl lead. Now, this tetraethyl lead in your engine uh, leaves uh, a, la a coating of, of lead on the engine, and that has to be removed. It's removed with what's called a scavenger, a material that will dissolve this lead while it's freshly deposited and hot. And the best scavenger turned out to be ethylene chloride, the Dutch liquid, which is the other uh, chlorinated hydrocarbon that I said was known before 1800. <coughs> About 1926, they began to introduce glycol antifreeze. Glycol antifreeze is also made from ethylene chloride. In 1928, Midgley, who worked for the General Motors Corporation and was actually a mechanical engineer, developed the refrigerant known as Freon, which has been universal ever since in modern refrigerating plants. That is a that is a compound in which some of the chlorine, some of the hydrogen, 
in methane has been replaced by chlorine and some by fluorine, which is a, a compound that's related to chlorine. I think it's time to get that slide back. Uh, in hopes that I can remove a few confusions. First of all, uh, this uh, here is the reaction uh, done by Basil Valentine before 1600. There's alcohol, with which some of you are probably familiar, <laughs> hydrochloric acid, and you get what I've called here monochlorobenzene, <coughs> uh, monochloroethane. Uh, I'm not sure that's what I called it before, but anyway, I was not going to want to worry about that. These things all have several names, unfortunately. The number two refers to uh, the reaction between chlorine and uh, ethylene, which you see up at the top there, in which those double bonds have been removed by being filled in with chlorine. CH2Cl, CH2Cl, which of course can also be written C2H4Cl2. Uh, well, here's chloroform, which I've already described. Here's carbon tetrachloride. You see they are, they're derived from that simplest hydrocarbon that I had on the top. These two are also used in dry, in dry cleaning very extensively now. And they have a double bond in them. But you can see that various quantities of H have been re placed by Cl, in this case three out of four, in this case four out of four. Yeah, can you get it up a little higher? Thank you, that's far enough. Uh, this, uh, now here are the fluorocarbons, the compounds I just mentioned, which have both fluorine and chlorine in them, including this uh, freon refrigerant. It's a strange kind of a compound. Midgley must have been an extraordinarily clever man to have figured out some of the things he did. Apparently, the, uh, <coughs> the reason he comes up with it, came up with this is because in a refrigerant, you want something that has just the right boiling point so you can keep boiling it and condensing it easily at about room temperature. You also want something that's non-toxic so if it leaks out into the room, it won't kill you. The, these compounds, uh, Midgley guessed, the compounds of this kind would fill a bill. He made some and they actually worked. They should be called, they're, they're called fluorocarbons. That's what he called them. But that implies that it's all fluorine. But there's both chlorine and fluorine. So that's a misnomer. But that's what they call them. So that's what I'll call them. Finally, as long as we can get rid of this chart once and for all, item eight here. I don't know how well you can see this. I guess I'll just have to hope. Is it focusable? Uh, uh, a number eight seems to be pretty bad. I can hardly see it myself. <coughs> there we go. That's better. Thank you. CH2, and then there's a double bond, CHCl. For some reason, that's called vinyl chloride. You notice that it really is related to these things, not very different. One point I want to make here is how simple all these things are. I'm sure you know how complicated organic molecules are nowadays that you see in textbooks, but these things are about as simple as they can get. Vinyl chloride you probably heard of, too. Well, that's what it is, and I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Thanks. May I have the light, please? <coughs> well, so the problem is on the way to solution. Uh, at least the uh, automobile and the, ex the replacement of inflammable by non-inflammable solvents went a long ways to solve the chlorine problem. But then the Second World War ensured the solution to the chlorine problem. About 1940, somebody discovered that Freon, this material which I just described as refrigerant, if you put it in a sealed can with a, f a liquid, <coughs> You pick up the can with your hand, the freon or the fluorocarbon evaporates, produces pressure inside the can, and you can squirt the fluid out. The aerosol can had been invented. It was first used to spray medicines in American troops, uh, used by the American troops in the Pacific War. Uh, since then, uh, the use of it must be all too familiar to you. <coughs> also in the Second World War, 
they attempted to make artificial rubber and succeeded in doing so. Among the artificial, among the materials they tried to use were chlorinated hydrocarbons like vinyl chloride, which polymerize. That means that the, under certain physical conditions, the molecules connect in long chains and become solid materials. Uh, names like thiocol, neoprene, uh, were uh, the names of artificial rubbers during the Second World War, and the most well-known of them was vinyl chloride. They were not very much like rubber sometimes, but they were used for plastics. Vinyl chloride came out of the war as one of the most widely used plastics, making phonographs, car seat covers. Almost all car seat covers are made out of vinyl chloride plastic. Uh, electric insulation, and so on. This material, vinyl chloride, had been discovered in 1835, and this application not made until 1940, over a hundred years later. 1942, DDT was introduced as an insecticide. That is a chlorinated hydrocarbon, a little more complicated than these, but it had been known since 1874. It was a miracle pesticide. It's been followed up by a lot of others. <coughs> By 1970, we read outcries in the chemical literature about the sodium problem. This alkali industry is now operated mainly to produce chlorine, and there are not enough uses for sodium to uh, make it economical, so this is the current worry. The per capita consumption of chlorine in the United States in 1935 was three and a half pounds. That's 1935. 1955, it was 41 pounds. 1975, it was 100 pounds. 55 percent of the salt made in this country, and we have by far the world's largest production, is used to make chlorine. Pri that's the primary purpose of, of producing the salt, is to produce chlorine. And of that chlorine, the, number, the proportion which is estimated to go into chlorinated hydrocarbons is estimated up to 70 percent. These are data from recent years. The United States consumption of vinyl chloride in 1973 was five and a half billion pounds. <coughs> Ethylene chloride, the Dutch liquid, eight billion pounds made in 1973. These are billions. In 19, as early as 1960, 670 million aerosol cans were manufactured in the United States. During the generation between 18, 1930 and 1960, the per capita consumption of all of these things together, solvents, plastics, pesticides, only the ones containing chlorine, increased on an average of nearly 20 times, 20-fold. That is to say, in 1960, we were using 20 times as much of these things as we were in 1930. So muskrat, you see, has been vindicated. Chemical research is useful after all. <coughs> what was the matter with those 19th century chemists? Well, one thing that was the matter with them might have been that they thought in using the chlorinated hydrocarbons to develop a theory of organic chemistry, they were actually making them useful, and it wasn't necessary to do more. Another thing that uh, must be said of the 19, early 19th century chemists is that they were very short time, about two generations away from alchemy, and they were not very anxious to get back into the kind of muddled mysticism and empiricism which they were trying to free chemistry from. Chemistry was hardly a science before the 19th century. The followers of Muspratt, the practical chemists, the practical uh, chemical engineers, certainly did not accomplish much in the solution to the chlorine problem during the rest of the 19th century. In fact, they accomplished so little that that may have something to do with why chemical engineering became an academic discipline in the 20th century instead of purely something you go out and learn by working in the works. Uh, the educated engineer of the 20th century is the person who is responsible for these marvelous, marvelously useful things. 
But of course, he got them <coughs> from reading old books written by chemists of nearly a hundred years earlier. The most important thing to say about it, well, uh, before I, I come to that, I, I, I would say something that's probably not necessary to say, because you must know it. If you don't know it, you should uh, check up on yourself. DDT has proven to have so many harmful side effects that it's been more or less banned. <coughs> Uh, in 1975, the James River in Virginia and much of, of uh, Chesapeake Bay were poisoned by something called capone, which is another chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticide. Uh, in 1976, a town called Mada, north of Na Milan in Italy, was abandoned because it was an explosion of something called TCDD. Something called PCB has been coming down the Hudson River and is the second most polluting material in the sea along the Atlantic coast. These acronyms and trade names all cover chlorinated hydrocarbons. And as a matter of fact, here is this morning's Washington Post, <coughs> which I read on the airplane. You probably can't read that from here, but the top line says chloroform in northern Virginia water exceeds safety level. <laughs> That's why I said that I, I didn't know whether I really needed to go into this. This one is an interesting wrinkle, I must say. It seems that the chlorination of the drinking water in northern Virginia is encountering, encountering methane, methane which is generated by sewage, which is also getting in the drinking water of Northern Virginia, and the two of them together are making chloroform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the solvents, the solvents, those solvents that are not exploding, are evaporating into the atmosphere at approximately the same rate as they are being manufactured today. The aerosols, or fluorocarbons, are charged with threatening the survival of the ozone layer to which they ascend. The solids, like vinyl chloride resins, end up as indigestible junk because they're not biodegradable. Or if they are heated strongly, they disintegrate to form chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and phosgene. A couple of workmen were killed in a Washington building recently when an electrical shortage occurred in a high voltage line. Uh, the heat uh, disintegrated the insulation, which is vinyl chloride, and produced chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and phosgene. However, once that's all pointed out, it needs also to be pointed out that DDT stopped the insect plagues. Uh, when I was young, I spent my summer vacations in South Dakota in the 30s, and I remember the grasshoppers coming over the hill in a, sing a solid cloud. I remember, I think it was something called chinch bug that destroyed the Iowa corn crop on a number of occasions. There's the other side of it. DDT stopped them, probably not permanently, but anyone who remembers those uh, the insects that infected this region in the 30s will go a little slow in criticizing, at least criticizing the people who tried DDT. Furthermore, the chlorinated hydrocarbon solvents did prevent fire. The plastics have replaced metals, <coughs> which would have probably run out before now if they hadn't. The one factor I think so I don't think there is much point in pursuing who is to be praised and who is to be blamed for this. But there is something I want to conclude with, which I think is worth thinking about. The factor here is one of scale, it seems to me. It's the scale on which everything is done today. And I want to introduce my few remarks about that with a quotation from Galileo the celebrated father of the scientific revolution, who wrote a famous book in 18, 1638 called Two New Sciences. 
the two new sciences. One of them was mechanics. He is the, uh, in that book, he uh, gives a mathematical expression for f falling, the behavior of falling bodies like stones. And that is, is probably the first step in the famous scientific revolution of the 17th century. That's what this book is used for. But there's another science in that book, strength of materials, we call it. The, he studied the, what it took to break a beam. Uh, the the uh, Venetian dockyard was famous for its huge cranes, and so Galileo writes about that. And he begins that book with some words like the following, which I'll paraphrase. There are, this is the dialogue between two people called Salviati and Segredo. Salviati says, experience with the famous arsenal in Venice seems to me to open a large field of, to speculative minds and particularly in that area which is called mechanics, because they have so many different kinds of machines. Then Segredo says, Indeed, I've sometimes been thrown into confusion and have despaired of understanding how th some things can happen that I see there. Salviati. You mean when we were trying to comprehend the reason why they make the sustaining apparatus, supports, blocks, and other things so much larger around those huge galleys than they do around little boats. Segredo, I do mean that, and particularly what we'd noticed that I have always considered to be an idle notion of the common people, that one cannot reason from the small to the large because so many mechanical devices succeed on a small scale that cannot succeed in great size. Now, all reasonings about mechanics have their foundations in geometry, and I don't see why largeness and smallness make any, difficult, any difference in things like circles. They don't change, big circles don't have different properties than small circles, so why should big, Cranes in dockyards have different properties than small cranes and big weights than small weights and large scale than small scale. Well, there is an answer to that in the science of applied mechanics. Uh, when the crane, uh, it's a complicated answer, but just to give you a rough idea, when the crane gets too big, the weight of the crane itself becomes a factor in the whole operation you're performing. But you will have no difficulty, I think, in thinking of cases where somebody has made a model of something that worked fine that wouldn't work in full size. Many people flew airplanes models before anyone ever succeeded in flying a full-scale airplane, for example. Well, that, I think, is what is going on in our society. The cyclotron laboratory is not just a bigger physics laboratory. There's something about it that's different in kind. A hospital using instrumental diagnosis is not just an enlargement of the family physician. A scientific society with 160,000 members is not just an enlarged version of the Royal Society of London. <coughs> a corporation is not just a big company, and a war machine is not just a big army. We might like to go back to the string and sealing wax laboratory, the country doctor, small business or the cavalry, but we can't do it because there are too many of us. <laughs> there were about a billion people in the world in 1800 when Malthus was explaining why it couldn't accommodate any more. In 1907, there were about a billion, six hundred million. In 1960, there were three billion, two hundred and twenty million people. That's a, an increase in scale, too. Everything is increased in scale, and I think that to solve problems which need to be solved, obviously, it would help if we could manage to think or discover or do research on what the significance is of the increase in scale, rather than go back and try and find the hero who developed something you like or the villain who develops who introduced something you don't like, they weren't heroes or villains. They couldn't foresee the future any better than we can. They couldn't foresee the scale on which all these things are done. And so I suggest it as an approach to the uh, 
study of the questions of which this seminar is concerned. And my justification for introducing the chlorinated hydrocarbons is I think they are a very striking example of the problem. Thank you. case, the, <coughs> the uh, impressive thing, of course, is changing from uh, a twenty-fold increase in the use of chlorine in a, sh in a short period of time is the uh, thought-provoking part of it. The question of how much chlorine the, uh, the wor world can stand, or, or better, how much how many man-made materials can the world stand? These are man-made materials, all of them, and uh, except chlorine itself. And how much of that can the Earth stand? Well, I, my guess, I don't know. That's the kind of thing the Environmental Protection Agency is very likely to give somebody a grant for. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but that you can even raise such, raise such questions is uh, a suggestion that, that one ought to start thinking about. Of course, there are all sorts of aspects of this that, that lead to that conclusion. Uh, I, I don't know whether I've answered your question or not, have I? Probably as well as one can. <coughs> yeah, as, in, as far as the 100 consumption of 100 pounds of chlorine per person is concerned, the only significant thing about it, I think, is that it's about 20 times as much as people were consuming a generation earlier. invented in the 19th century, and uh, which did not come to be used until 1940, 1941, yeah. and so on. Uh, is this also um, a dimension of, of um, the, the present days that things get um, put into production almost as soon as they are invented? <coughs> yeah, they're all kind of, th this is sort of interesting from the point of view of time lags. I don't think it fits any theory I ever heard about time lags. I've heard papers where people say, uh, in the 19th century, the time lag was such and such, and in the 20th century, it's reduced to some other very small number. Well, maybe so. This case suggests that, that the, uh, the time lag, I don't think, represents much of anything. It was, it was the, cl the chlorine problem needed to be solved. And when the chlorine problem needed to be solved, they went back in those old books and found these century-old uh, substances. They also found that the chemists had described their properties. Those, the chemists who made them in the first place said the more chlorine you put in, the less inflammable it gets. What was needed was for somebody to say, we ought to have non-inflammable solvents. But they went on using inflammable solvents through the 19th century, and one wonders if they ever would have introduced non-inflammable solvents if it hadn't been for the chlorine salesman, who had all his chlorine to get rid of. <coughs> I mean, I've got much, not got much better explanation than that to offer. I have no theory about time lag. I don't see any there. The chlorine problem of the 20th century is surely what brought all these immense uses into being. They gave an incentive. In other words, we should soon expect a proliferation of sodium products as well. Uh, I, I, since we now have sodium <laughs> products are generally biodegradable, as far as I know. But uh, 
I don't know that I can say any more than that about what we should do. This Schwingler School of Chemistry perceive problems with inventing these sort of non-natural substances like, like we're talking about now? I'm sorry, would you say that again? I guess I come from the Swindler School, the people who objected to making hydrocarbons. Oh, uh, the objection to the hydrocarbons was not to making them. It was to the affront that this whole, this whole method of uh, theory of organic chemistry gave to the traditional theory. This was a typical inter-academic fight. The traditional theory was that all compounds, organic or otherwise, consist of a positive part and a negative part. And this chlorine, the work was being done with chlorinated hydrocarbons, seemed to contradict it because chlorine, which was negative, was replacing hydrogen, which is positive. This was a kind of an internal matter. No. No, that, uh, there's nothing about that in there. It was simply an insult to the fathers of the science who had posed the old theory that was being replaced. Nothing more to it than that. They were made in small quantities. <laughs> uh, until these things began to be produced in enormous quantities, the questions didn't exist. <laughs> I mean, nobody would get up and denounce DTT if only small amounts of it were being used. There'd be no reason to. Yeah. The same is true of strontium-90. Of what? Of strontium-90. Oh, sh yeah, sure. Scale. That we live in a world dominated by scale, but we reason about this world in terms of a world that's gone. Not very long gone, only about f maybe 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but now, hardly anything happens in, unless it happens on an enormous scale. From the hula hoop to rock music to chlorinated hydrocarbons, it's worldwide on a mass scale. And it becomes a different phenomenon, that's my argument. Sometimes the definition between what is natural and unnatural isn't always obvious. We forget, for example, in the case of chlorine, that there is a world where there's lots of chlorine right here on Earth, and that's on, under the ocean. Under the ocean? In the ocean. Well, it exists there as sodium chloride. No, not all. There are many, it's being found now, that many plants and animals in the ocean indeed have chlorinated hydrocarbons in them. Is that so? I didn't know it. Right. Are they edible? <laughs> Most of them would be very toxic to us, but they must do something for them. In their, in their own society. <laughs> yeah. uh, when we talk about technology and value systems, I think the, the problem of, of mass problems and overreaction to them is something we have to live with today that uh, the German chemists of the last century that have enjoyed just insulting each other in journals uh, didn't have. And uh, I think there are many examples of this in modern science, modern scholarship that we face. I think recombinant D DNA is one case where uh, society as a whole is running scared, and so they're going to put, uh, I think, uh, much too strict regulations on what a person can do or the use of, uh, of drugs of various kinds, uh, even in fairly innocuous ways now, are under such a bureaucratic shield uh, that it takes years to be able to inject a rat with uh, some anesthetic, because you have to have all of the, the uh, permissions from the federal government down to uh, the city of Ames to be able to do that. So I think this this fact of backlash which has existed in all societies is with us in a very pernicious form today. That is, because there is a problem over which the scientist or the scholar has no control, there tends to be over-regulation of the scientist and over-regulation of his creative effort. And I think as, if we're talking about technology and society, this is a problem which uh, I don't think many people are facing now that is of stifling creative effort because everybody's running scared. 
Well, I don't think there's any doubt that is the case. Uh, and what I'm suggesting I, uh, is, is a somewhat, a, not a glittering generality, but a generality, all right, simply that an awareness of the scale factor would, would improve our ability to discuss these things sensibly and to avoid the heroes and villains approach, which is Im embedded in what you're speaking of, I think. That the, uh, to pass laws against the multitude of things by which we're plagued nowadays, it does sound rather impractical. <coughs> And if it's done, it will probably be bad law and so forth. Well, my little contribution to all that is supposed to